You mean which part of the slide? Well, it's the functionality provided by Keynote. <laughs> yeah. I think they are 102. Oh, 102. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think Thank you. All right, so sorry for the turbulence earlier today because we moved the classroom um, and they actually swapped the classroom of us with another class and um, originally I thought it's not, well, you know, like I have, like they keep changing our classroom for, for reasons and, um, but I think this classroom is better uh, in a way that is closer to where the CS department are. Uh, and also, I think, uh, you know, like, okay, so I, I don't know how many of you have the experience of booking tickets, right, and uh, flight tickets. And typically, they will put you a prefix. And I would always, like, okay, the first time I got my PhD, I was really excited. Uh, are you the help desk? So we were originally having trouble pulling this down. And I think it's working now. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Okay, so, or, well, you know, every time when I booked the ticket, I was hesitating if I should put the doctor uh, before my name because I'm, I'm not officially a doctor, right? Like a PhD. Um, however, then at some point, I realized that, you know, if I put the doctor, if some, there is an emergency on the airplane, they would, uh, <laughs> yeah, they would call me to help, but I don't know how to help, right? Uh, but today, teaching in this uh, school of medicine, I feel like I'm clo <laughs> being closer to doctor. All right, so uh, today we are going to continue our discussion on performance. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, how to compare which one is better. Uh, but before we start, uh, we are starting again with John von Neumann. And the reason is because the big picture of computer architecture is generally a von Neumann architecture. And if you never see this guy, uh, you are probably in biology class, right? And you should, you should go to a different classroom. Um, so what's the, what's the big thing about von Neumann architecture is that we have three main components, uh, the processor, the memory, and uh, in the original proposal of von Neumann architecture, there is not such a thing in storage. I add this up into the von Neumann architecture because it's hard to imagine that a computer without storage nowadays. And what happened in using a von Neumann computer is that, well, first of all, you write a program, and uh, once your program is written, uh, you will compile it or generate machine code in some, in some way. And this machine code is typically stored in a storage. And when you need to run a program, what happens is that it's either the programming language runtime 
or the operating system would dynamically load this generated machine code into your machine memory. And then what's really good about this architecture is that the processor would fetch the instructions from uh, beginning from a contract address where uh, both the software and hardware agrees that a program should start here. And what's inside that address is actually an instruction. And by looking into that instruction, the processor will figure out what to do. And if this is an instruction that needs to access memory, then uh, the processor would go to the memory again to fetch the data we need. However, uh, once we are done with that instruction, it's natural that we will go down to the next instruction depending on um, what the instruction, uh, what, what's the outcome of the instruction. And most of the time, if your instruction finishes, and if this is an instruction that doesn't change the control flow, you would go to the next instruction. However, if you meet an instruction that is a branch instruction, that is a jump instruction, uh, then um, you would potentially change the memory address. So yesterday I saw an, a post on Piazza saying that, hey, does the jump and branch instruction count? And the answer is definitely yes, because without having that jump or branch instruction executed, there's no way the program would know where is the next instruction. So that one is important. And, uh, but the beauty of this architecture is that imagine if you put a completely different content into the memory, then the computer can act completely differently. So then uh, you could actually reuse the same computer, the same set of hardware as completely different machines. So like your machine, right? Like, okay, everyone, every time when you press Alt and Tab, Alt, 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 Alt and Tab, right? You can, you can switch to a different program, right? And it's really useful when during your childhood when your parents come in, right? Like you were probably like playing some kind of uh, online game, right? Like um, like League of Legends, right? And then, uh, and then, and then, and then uh, you hear some steps coming in and then you press Alt and Tab, right? And then it switch, oh, it's ah, Jupyter Notebook. Okay, you're working hard, right? Or, you know, the same hardware, it could be a very good gaming machine. Right, because it has a very powerful GPU, but also could be a machine running machine learning model, right? And it could also be a machine uh, do Bitcoin mining, right? So that means uh, the volume architecture is being so welcoming because of the flexibility and the reprogrammability it provides. And um, again, we mentioned the last time, the most important thing that we care about in performance is actually time. So how much time does a program uh, uh, consume is actually, uh, well, so the execution time of a program actually defines the performance. So uh, when we refer to performance without other mentioning, uh, it's by default the flip of the execution time. And why we say it's a flip? Because the shorter the execution time, the better the performance. And the execution time is defined by three different components how many dynamic instructions that your program would consume, and then how many cycles per instruction would take, and finally, how many seconds per cycle. So these three components is called, uh, is defines your performance, and uh, typically, we don't sell your processor in a way that we tells you how many seconds per cycle. We only tell you the frequency of the processor most of the time, so that's why uh, we also put a note here, uh, if you only have the frequency, don't be panicked, you still can uh, uh, calculate your performance by just taking one over the frequency of your clock rate. And uh, typically one nanosecond, um, per, uh, typically like one gigahertz means one nanoseconds per cycle. Uh, that's because most of the, uh, that's, uh, and most of our processes right now are at the gigahertz level. Okay, so, uh, well, typically we, we will say like it's ET equal to IC times CTI times CT. And a CT, uh, well, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, medical school, right? So this is not a CT that medical school would say. It's the cycle time. And the CPI means cycle per instruction. IC means instruction count. So that's the, that's the performance equation. 
And performance equation is so important because not only the end-to-end -end latency, not only the response time, throughput, energy consumption, uh, cost of operation, everything is related to time. So that's why we care about time. And uh, in the last lecture, we talked about who can affect performance. And it turns out that programmers can do a lot. For example, uh, if you can uh, recap yourself on this particular uh, demo, you would figure out that there's no change in the complexity of the program. And the result would totally be the same. The number of instructions that both sides would generate is also the same. And the clock rate, if it's running on the same processor, there is no difference. So what really the programmer changes is the CPI. And on the left-hand side, it's a lot better than the right-hand side because if you write your program on the left-hand side, it, uh, it's actually better fitting uh, the hardware design. So that's why, as a programmer, you really should know how your hardware is designed so that you can write the right program, even though both sides look about the same in terms of computational complexity or from algorithm's perspective. So in a lot of the case, a lot of people would say, hey, both you and I implement the same algorithm from the textbook. Why mine is not performing as good as yours? And the answer is probably because um, the, uh, the other party um, has better idea about how to write the code in a way make the algorithm more, um, uh, more um, adaptive to the hardware we have. And Another example that is also counterintuitive is that if we add the red part, which is the sorting, uh, it actually makes the performance better. And in this case, again, programmers not only change the CPI, but also change the instruction count. Uh, however, uh, it changes the instruction count in a more positive, uh, in, in, in a bad way that we increase the instruction count. But the CPI is actually better. Uh, because if you have the data sorted, uh, it actually makes the branch prediction easier. So, uh, and regarding uh, what branch prediction is, how it works, we will talk about that in the midterm, uh, after the midterm, so don't worry about that too much. All you need to remember right now is that for there are also classes that, uh, uh, cases that uh, if you have more instruction count, uh, your CPI would be better. So there's no golden rule that uh, if you make the instruction count larger, your performance will be worse, right? And that's something counterintuitive from the computational complexity or algorithm part because uh, complexity tells you uh, if you can reduce the amount of operations, you would have better performance. However, that's totally not true in modern architecture. So that's why in addition to uh, algorithm class, you also need to learn uh, computer architecture. So as a recap from what we learned from the last lecture is that execution time is the most essential uh, performance metrics. And um, instruction count, CPI, and cycle time defines the execution time. And programmers can control everything. And today, we are going to continue our discussion on what other factors could affect performance equation. And we will talk about the definition of speed up. And we are also going to uh, dive into another law that you need to memorize and computer architecture code MDOS law and its implications. So let's start with this uh, interesting question. So uh, how many can programming language affect?
right, let's see what do you guys think. So looks like uh, C is the most popular answer. So most of you this, uh, feel like two is the right answer, right? But sometimes the two that you have in mind might be different from the two uh, others have in mind. So why don't you guys go ahead and discuss again to see if you are still thinking about two. And maybe when you unionize or intersect your answer, it will become one or three. Right, so go ahead, talk to your friends in 90 seconds. All right, so let's see. After discussion, okay, 76% of you think it's C, right? So, you know, that's the, I would say that's the violence of democracy uh, because if you feel like, okay, majority vote C, then I should vote C, even though I don't know what the C really means, right? So what do you think the C means here? What What's the meaning of C here? It sounds reasonable. Yeah, you know, like every time if it, there is a multiple choice question, I don't know the answer, I would pick C. But what are the two that you recognize here? Uh, I recognize C. Uh, I mean, the, the two. Oh, the two, okay. Uh, the instruction count and the cycle per instruction. Okay, do you guys all agree with that? Okay, so the only thing that programming language cannot control is the cycle time. Because, uh, well, the programmer can control the cycle time by through a function call. However, without the programmer invoking that function, the programming language itself won't dynamically adjust the cycle time for you. Because uh, programming language is supposed to be agnostic to the hardware that is running on top of it. Otherwise, it's actually breaking the abstraction of uh, programming language. So, that's the thing that programming language won't affect. Okay, so, you know, people love talking about programming languages, and I know there is some time, there must be some, um, some period of time you feel like, okay, I should learn a lot of programming languages, right? And, uh, you know, like there are several very popular programming languages, like Java. How many of you ever wrote a program in Java? Okay, how about Python? Okay, how about C? C++. Okay, so if you didn't raise your hand, I'm 100% for sure you haven't started your assignment one, right? And how about Perl? Okay, you know, like um, it, when I was an undergrad, don't, 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 don't try to Google search it. But when I was an undergrad, Perl is like the Python uh, at that time. It's also an interpreter-based language. And this is like the black, black Perl because people uh, wrote a poem using uh, Perl. So this, so people like a lot of people would say like Perl is the most beautiful language, uh, programming language all over the world. And uh, and and the surprisingly is surprising thing is that this program can actually execute it, can actually execute. All right. So okay, you have so many programming languages, right? But today we are talking about performance. So 
how which of the following programming language is the most wordy in terms of machine language? All right, individual vote. Think individually at this time. Your intuition. All right, so after the first round of votes, we will see 42% of you think it's C, uh, Java, and 29% of you think it's actually E, uh, Python. And uh, why don't you guys go ahead and discuss with others to see, uh, to justify your answers in front of others, and that would make the, uh, and vote again. All right, go ahead. All right, so let's see, after discussion, are you guys going with the violence of democracy? Okay, so 50% of you, okay, Java won, right? Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I want to hear from you. Like, why do you think Java is uh, consuming the most instruction count when we do the program? Can someone share your thoughts? Okay, uh, say again. It, you say it's low local libraries, but wasn't that the case of C and C++? Wasn't that the case for Python either? Um, but Java is bigger, heavier. But, uh, in my but why is it bigger and heavier? It supports a lot of things. Like, uh, yeah. Well, C++, C++ is also powerful, right? It supports more things than Java. So that's not, well, I mean, that's a good observation. A lot of features in Java would actually make Java heavier, but it's not about like being able to call a lot of libraries. It's something else. Yeah, okay, so you pointed out, right? So, okay, so what's the feature of Java? So, uh, so okay, so Java, uh, it was, it, it has a, its own background in a way that uh, in the past, uh, programming is actually not that easy because uh, you can only have uh, C and C++ most of the time. And it turns out that, um, uh, okay, so I would say 
the birth of Java is actually um, related to um, the demand of mobile computing. So um, in the past, right, like if you, well, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the world um, in a way that uh, old mobile phones are architecture the same. And it's not even like mobile phones, they would have uh, the same operating system. Right now, you know like most of the time mobile phone has Android and iOS. But in the past, like there is Symbian, there is, I think Nokia has its own one, Motorola has its own one, and uh, Sony Ericsson, they have their own one in the past, right? So there are many, many different companies. They manufacture this uh, um, mobile phones. And they all want to have their own, uh, because they want to provide their user experiences. However, uh, as an application designer, you want to have just one set of binary and people can run it on everywhere. So that's the birth of Java. And because uh, for web, for mobile phones, mobile computing, you actually want the same pieces of code to be able to run on very different, many different computers or different platforms. And that turns out to be Java. And uh, what happened in the Java architecture is that, okay, so let's take a look at this. So um, is that instead of generating the machine code directly, they would first, after the compiler, like the Java C compiler, they would generate something called Java bytecode, which is universal binary uh, that all Java program would emit. And what happened is that as long as your platform, like Symbian, uh, Windows, Mac, you have a Java virtual machine installed, you are able to dynamically interpret this machine code, Java bytecode, and uh, make it uh, the machine code natively on the computer executing this Java virtual machine so that the same binary can work on different computers. But as you can imagine, there will be an overhead there, right? Okay, so do you want to make a guess how slower is Java compared against Python, for example? How many orders of magnitude? Is it slower? Okay. Oh yeah. Is it slower, right? Okay. So so we should run a demo first. Okay. So that we would know if it's really slower. <sighs> okay. Uh, let me see. Where's my cursor? Hello? Okay, here we go. Wait. Okay, here we go. So this is the same notebook interface, and I'm trying to use the notebook interface as much as possible. Okay, so how programming languages affect performance? Let's start with Python. Okay, Python is pretty simple. If you want to play, uh, if you want to print Hello World, just print Hello World. And again, we, let's use our good friend perfstat to see how many instructions that we need. So if it needs 87, 88 millions of instructions, can't believe, right? 88 millions of instructions in Hello World. And it takes 0, 0, 0.2 seconds for running this Python program. The most beautiful language called Perl, and uh, it takes uh, this four lines of code, first of all, tell the system we are using Perl, and streak use warnings, and again, print hello world. And how much, how many instructions? Okay, 12 million instructions, right? A lot more manageable, and it's 0 0.006. Okay, you know, like um, two decades ago, the, the language is actually more efficient. Now, lovely Java. Okay, public class, hello world, um, object oriented, right? And within here, we have a main method, uh, system.out print line, hello world, right? Let's see, how much would it, how many instructions? It would take, oh boy. 153 mil millions of instructions. That's actually 10 times more than um, Perl, right? 10 times more than Perl, and double the amount as uh, Python, right? So it also takes about double the time of Python, right? And where is why is that? Because 
Uh, first of all, right, regarding all the interpreter-based language, it does have the overhead of dynamically interpreting uh, your language into uh, the native machine code on the fly. However, Java has one more layer that you have to not only interpreting from the bytecode, but also uh, Java bytecode is designed in a way that it makes no assumption of the architecture. What does that mean is that it doesn't use register at all. So you would, it would generate a lot of memory operations uh, uh, to additionally, uh, to make uh, the in, uh, interpret, dynamically interpret the machine code to use registers. So, but the same thing won't happen in Python. So that's why Python is even more eff uh, efficient than Java in, several, uh, in most of the cases. However, Java is also good in a way that because it has the uh, compiled version. So for companies that doesn't want to uh, open source, you can still uh, send people the dot class file without sending them the source file. But for Python, you always need a source file. So commercially, people don't use uh, Python that much unless they are pretty open-minded. All right, so um, that's the, but in terms of performance, right, you will figure out that, whoa, boy, right? It's so slow, right? Like Java is so slow. But um, now let's look at other options, right? So Java is so slow, right? And so far, uh, the performance crown is fall on Perl, right? But is Perl the most efficient on the options? Who, is, who do you think is the most efficient on the options we have? C, C okay, that's C if you are right. But you know, like uh, Google, they also have the language called Go, right? So Go has two modes, in the interpreter mode and also the compiled mode. So let's see how the interpreter mode looks like. So if you look at Google's in, uh, Go's interpreter mode, it's actually the worst, right? Almost like uh, one billion instructions. However, if you are able to compile it, uh, it's only four million instructions, right? So Go, it could be the most inefficient one, could also be the most efficient one at this point. Very interesting, right? Okay, C++. A lot of us lost plus C++ for its uh, features of object-oriented uh, programming, but also a lot of uh, standard library that support it. So let's see how what's the performance of C++ look like. If you want to write Hello World, uh, C out Hello World, and uh, it takes ooh, three million instructions, right? Even smaller amount than Go, and the performance is actually very good, right? So here's the thing: uh, even though there are new languages that's coming up, but why C++ is intensively used for a reason: performance, right? And a lot of features it supports. And in fact, uh, when, I, when I worked for Google, I was so surprised how intensive uh, C++ was used in the company. And um, even though the backend of Python, like, like the TensorFlow, right, you, you will feel like, okay, it's all Python interface, right? But in fact, when you like, uh, call like a tflight.interpreter, it's actually C++ working in the backend, and the Python is just a wrapper to this function, right? So in fact, uh, for the infrastructure, even though we have Go, right? But most of the time, uh, because for, for companies, right? If you can save this 0, 0 0.1 second, it means like if you have 10,000 customers, it will be 0, 0.1, uh, um, uh, sorry, 0 0.001 times 10,000, right? Then it's a lot of money, right? So then uh, they would try to save every penny as possible. So C++ is a good option. In another language, you might feel like, okay, this is like a grandfather old language. How, why should we still looking at this hollow world? And the answer is because if you look at the instruction count, it's not even reaching a million, right? It's very, very fast, right? So what does that mean? Is that uh, programming language actually affects a lot. It goes from even though like, okay, it seems like um, Python, uh, you only need one line of code from the programmer's perspective. It actually, on, in the backend, generate millions of instructions. 
and um, the instruction count would make it very, very incompetitive compared against other programming languages we have. So uh, Java is actually the worst among them if you set the interpreter mode of Go aside. So in terms of the programming language, you really have to uh, choose them carefully. If you don't have a strong reason or if you don't care about performance, right, then you can probably go with Java. But if you really want to go with performance and depending on how much money you want to save for the company, you probably want to go with C or C++, right? And for Python, I would say, okay, it's good in a way that if I just want to proof of concept, if I just want to um, have a quick result of if this model is going to work, if this uh, algorithm is going to work, I can try to use Python. But in production code, uh, that's actually not something um, companies would like to use because Python has a lot of performance issues and uh, thinking about the 10 times performance difference, right? It means that the same thing, I only need one computer in C, but I probably need 10 computers in Python, which make your, perform, uh, which make your service costs a lot worse than the C programmers. So in fact, uh, it's very interesting. So how many of you heard Gemini? Okay, you should have heard Gemini, right? A lot of backend uh, in Gemini, especially the mobile phone version, on-device version of the Gemini. Um, we don't use Python, we use C to, uh, to, to, to do those inference and, um, for, for on device. Otherwise, it won't make the performance um, qualified uh, or say uh, for, for uh, providing the quality of service that we want. So actually, um, program languages affect a lot. So um, and here, so here's the thing, right? So programming language affect two of them, and uh, com uh, and programmers is the one who can make the right choice of programming languages. Okay, so how about compilers? Oops. Sorry. one okay so um most of you think the answer is c so it means two so what do you guys think um the compiler can affect which are the two or which okay let's try this which is the one the compiler cannot affect one two three okay let's try to do it again which, okay, let's say instruction count, CPI, cycle time. Okay, which is the one that compiler cannot affect? Okay, I hear some different answers. Which is the one that you guys think compiler cannot affect? Okay, here here we go. Right again, similar to programming language, uh, compiler uh, it does have the assumption of a uh, specific machine. So it tailors uh, the generated code for a specific machine. However, again, without the programmer specifically saying, the only thing that compiler cannot do is that if the programmer didn't ask the compiler to do something, the compiler cannot be too intelligent in uh, modifying your code. It cannot 
do things that the programmer doesn't want the program to do. So if the programmer doesn't say, I want to change the cycle time, the compiler won't change the cycle time. So again, um, the compiler uh, would not change the cycle time. But by how much the compiler can change, right? So one of the big questions you have in mind is that, OK, both sides, right, they look about the same, right? And from a human being's perspective, even for me, I can tell they will generate the same result, right? Can a compiler optimization help? So here I'm going to show you with dash O0 and dash O3, what can compiler do? So let's try to see. Um, OK. Here, uh, again, we have this unoptimized um, version. And if you remember, it takes 0.8 uh, seconds. And for uh, B, which is the one with uh, we traverse J and then I, it takes zero, uh, 1.5 seconds, right? So twice difference, even though the complexity is exactly the same. But now, let's try to see how much the compiler optimization can help on version 8. So with version 8, after compiler optimization, it takes only 0.6 seconds, which is 0.2 seconds down from the original one. How about the version B? So for the version B, C, it still takes 1.3 seconds. What does that mean? So if the programmer has nonsense about what's the better code for computer architecture, there's no way compiler can help you. You know, compiler cannot assume your code would be would still be correct after I flip the order in traversal. So compiler has its own limitation. And uh, the rule, the golden rule of compiler optimization is that it won't change the programmer's behavior. So it only does optimization in a very limited scope. So if you want the code to change from the version A from, ver uh, from version B to version A using the compiler, it's not happening. Programmer has to do it. All right. So that's uh, right. So compiler has limited effect if the programmer didn't do the right thing. Right. So that's why you guys are so important. Right. So programmers can control all factors that affect performance. Different programming languages can generate machine operations with different orders of magnitude of performance. However, programmers as you are the one who decide what kind of programming language we want to use. And finally, compiler optimization can help, but in a very limited scope. It won't change a, 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 a poorly written code to a perfectly written code in terms of performance. So that's why. As a programmer in CS department, you have to learn computer architecture. So um, that's uh, that's the performance part. Uh, what affects performance? So now um, let me see. A lot of you will be asking, okay, why are we still caring about com complexity, right? And the answer for me is, well, complexity uh, provides a good estimate on the performance if one day. If one day every instruction would take exactly the same amount of time, if one day every operation would take exactly the same amount of instructions, then algorithm complexity would really make sense. If one day, do you think that one day is coming? I don't see it's unlikely to be true, right? Okay, so now uh, we are going to go into another topic. So um, today our topic is actually what is better, right? And um, you know, grow up in an Asian family, we have a lot of who is better this kind of debate since our childhood, right? Like you know, your parents would say, oh, you know, uh, there's always a neighbor who is better. <laughs> okay, I can, I, I can hear a lot of you are coherent with that, right? But by how much your neighbor is better? Better, right? So again, comparison is important. Uh, I, re I I consider there is a value of uh, performance comparison, but in terms of computer architecture, we need to have a standard of comparing the betterness of your performance, and to that we define that as 
a term called speed up. So in your reading, you probably learned what is speed up, but I want to confirm that we are on the same page before we can go ahead. So why don't you show me your understanding about speed up? So give you a hint, the machine X is exactly the machine, uh, the performance equation we have in the last lecture. So if you happen to remember the execution time of that, All right, let's see what do you guys have after discussion. Okay, I love this figure. It means that we need discussion. So why don't you guys go ahead and discuss with your friend regarding how much y is better than x. All right, so let's see what do you guys have after the discussion. Huh. Okay, so B, C, D all has its own advocator. So 
so it means that we really need to put everybody on the same page for speed up. So if I'm talking about speed up oops, uh, of x of y over x, right? Like how much better? So it actually means that okay, let's say you are the x, right, and uh, your neighbor is the y, right? So sometimes you can ask, okay, by how much my your your, your our lovely neighbor is better than mine than me, right? So you need that numerical qual quantitative um, comparison, right? And that's, that's actually why this book is called Quantitative Approach, right? Because it actually tried to quantify the performance, tried to quantify the speed up. So uh, in this book, if I am talking about performance of y over x, what was that? How, what's the definition of that? It's execution time of x over execution time of y, right? And remember, our definition of performance of x is actually 1 over execution time x. And the performance of y is actually 1 over execution time of y, right? So if you think about performance in this way, 1 over execution time y over 1 over execution time of x, you are actually getting this execution time of x over execution time y, right? So the execution time x has to be on the top. So in this way, what's the execution time of y if we are talking about y over x? So similar, oh sorry, similar to the perform, using the performance equation that we have in the last lecture, right? You will get it's actually two seconds. And remember from our last lecture, the execution time x is 2.5. So it's 2.5 over 2 is d, not other answers. right? So it's not 0 0.8. If you had 0 0.8, you actually flip it. right? And if you have b, you might think, OK, I'm subtracting the 1. No, it's, you don't have to do that. right? So it's actually just execution time x over execution time y. That's what we want. So the answer would be 1.25. OK? The only definition of speed up. Question? No, because if you think about, oh, OK, so this part should be 20% times 4. Yes. Uh, that was 1.2 uh, plus um, 0.8. Okay, that will change the equation. Okay, okay, I will, I will, I will fix that. All right, good catch. All right, so, but that's assume. <laughs> <laughs> this is four. Uh, this should be three. Okay, should be three. Okay, I will fix it. All right. Um, OK, so the first takeaway here is that the quantitative approach in calculating the speed up is actually execution time x over execution time y. Now, in the readings, you are reading this paper, m dot law and its implication in the multi-core era. So we are introducing another law. So we have been talking about several different uh, people in computer architecture, right? We have talked about the oldest one, John von Neumann. We have been talking about Gordon Moore. And another one we are going to talk about is M. Dahl. And he is actually an entrepreneur. And uh, he actually had this law called speed up of uh, uh, F Fs uh, is equal to 1 over 1 minus F plus uh, F over S. And the S here, F here is the fraction of time in the original program that we are going to optimize. And the speed up we can achieve on f is designed is is denoted as s. So that's m dot law. Okay. So right now you are probably very confusing, right? Like, okay, isn't the speed up uh, the execution time of baseline over the enhanced? And professor, you remember like a few seconds ago you just talked about speed up execution time x over execution time y. It's the only definition of speed up in this book. Where he introduced this one? 
and you call this M as well, right? And don't be panicked. This is the graphical representation of M as well, and that's why I'm saying he is an entrepreneur, and you know, like businessmen, they try to sell you the same thing with different package. <laughs> so let's see how this new package would be the same as the big uh, as this. Uh, as the, the original one. So consider um, one. So right now, that's no matter how much the institution time it was in the very beginning, that's rescale the institution time of the original program as one. Okay, so everything takes one, no matter what that one is, right? One of the, uh, the original program. And in the original program, we have two parts. And the first part, which is the part we are going to optimize, would take f amount of time within this one. So, which means that the other part that is not affected by your optimization is going to be one minus f. Are we all good with this? Okay, so if we have an enhancement an optimization that works on the F part. So in the new execution time, are we going to affect the execution time of this one minus F part? Probably not, right? So one minus F remains the same. How about the execution time of the F part? If we are able to optimize it in a way that we get S time speed up, how much? F over S, right? So now, let's use the speed up equation again, right? So it turns out that's one over one minus F plus F over S. That's exactly the same thing, right? So in fact, M loss law didn't violate the definition, the only definition of speed up in computer architecture. It tried to sell, it tries to sell you the same concept with different package. And why we still embrace this new package? Because there is actually a few implement, Im, implications that this, this, this entrepreneur, this businessman can teach us. So uh, the second thing called, uh, the second thing about speed up is M Doslo is actually rewriting the original speed up equation in this way. So now let's talk about why this could be useful, I don't know how many of you recognize this game, but you know, like uh, if you are an intensive gamer, at some point you might have it. Yes, right? Right? So here's the thing uh, Final Fantasy 15, when it actually spends a lot of time in loading a map because it's really good uh, in terms of the graphical presentation. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was released in a time that a lot of people still have a uh, hardest drive as their main story. So uh, some people on Steam forum uh, actually talk about, okay, uh, why is it so slow in a Windows edition? And um, they say, I, ran the, I run this program on a hard drive and it takes pretty long, um, right? So, he, and in fact, uh, the profiling says that 95% of the time is on the hard disk drive. So now, if I have an SSD, Right, which is 100 times faster uh, than hard disk drive on this 95% of the time, by how much can we speed, speed up the map loading process?
What? No, I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. You know, okay, I can talk to you more about this. So, you know, originally I found that I'm the only weird person in the world. Uh, in a way that I, well, I mean, I do have a Steam account and I still buy games. And sometimes I buy physical games uh, from Japan, but I never open them. <laughs> and I found right now when, well, it's pretty sad, right? It's sad middle age life, right? So the thing is, a lot of friends of mine, including me, we are playing a game of buying games. <laughs> And every time we are talking about like, okay, what new games did you buy? Did you buy this week? Yeah, I buy this. I bought this, right? Have you played it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are collecting games. We are like yeah, like a Pokemon series, right? Like the last time a friend of mine he visits my office and he say, well, he he see an un unpacked Pokemon game, and and he said that. That's unpacked. And I say, uh, yeah, I bought that like a year and a half ago, and I haven't got a time to play with it. And he said, can I take it? And I say, sure, go ahead and take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, maybe one day if you visit my office hours, uh, you, you see that, you want to play it, you get a free game. Anyway, all right, let's see. What do you guys have? <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, so 53% of you think it's C, some of you think it's D, some of you think it's B. So why don't you go ahead and discuss with your friend again in 90 seconds and synchronize your answers. Maybe some of you will figure out there are something wrong in your calculation. So go! No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have time. No. No. What? Uh, yeah, I started to have my first console as a freshman. That's how your family control you to be. A, they always treat me like, they always trick me like, okay, if you get like the first place, I will buy you a new console. And that never happens in the first 18 years of my life. <laughs> and I bought my first console, used the salary I got from a part time job. <laughs> All right, so after discussion, okay, 70% of you agree is C. So from the mess here, what do you guys think? Go with C. Go with C. So how do you put the math? Do you want to um, uh, write it down on my slide? Okay, here's the... That's okay. Okay, here we go. Um, this one? Okay, one over one minus F. So the F is 0 0.29 and plus, yeah, 0 
right? And over 100. Okay, so that would give us the answer of C. Do you guys agree with that? So that's the right way of using MDOS low, right? So it's telling you, okay, it sounds like we're going to get 100 times speed up, right? 95%, 100 times. But we are not even close to, close to 100, right? So that's actually something that uh, MDOS low can tell you. And in fact, you can apply MDOS low for multiple optimizations as well. So for example, uh, if both of them are disjoint, right? If I have two optimizations, and if they are disjoint, then uh, I can extend this MDOS law as with this, right? Like it's one over one minus F opt of one, uh, F opt two plus F option one, F option S option one plus blah, 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 right? And if they are not disjoint, uh, it's going to be more complicated because you have to find out uh, the synthesized uh, effect of an optimization on both sides and make them th uh, three disjoint part, right? So that's, and again, extend your, uh, your formula like this. So and also could be really complicated, but right now I'm going to uh, ask you to evaluate a more complicated case. So, Right now, you are having upgrading two things, right? That's why gaming used to be a driving force of uh, computer system upgrade. Like now, you're not only going to have the flash drive, but also have a better processor. So how much we can speed up the map loading process with both? Assume the software overhead is the remaining five percent. Yep, you can assume the software overhead is all the remaining five percent. So 73% of you agree it's D. So I just need some of you to convince me that you guys are uh, able to get the answer D. I know a lot of you are thinking about, huh, we do more things than uh, this, uh, the original version. So it must be better than C. But it's not going to be 100, right? Is that what you thought? <laughs> okay. 
So how 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 you get here, Cameron? I don't know. You do you don't know? Sorry. How about you, Ben? Yeah. Okay. I just used your formula yep. on the last slide. Okay. Okay. I'm just writing up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that's zero, right? So that's the bottom part, right? And 0 0.95 divided by 100 plus 0 0.005 divided by 2 and 1 over that, right? And you will get... 28.5, right? So then that run up to 29. Great, right? So that's the application of MDOS law, right? So you are going to get uh, 28 times, right? Okay, so um, now I want to ask you one more thing. So you know, sometimes your boss uh, would say, hey, uh, I want you to achieve two times speed up uh, after uh, um, I want, so after using uh, the solid state drive, right now you have uh, a new technology. I want you to achieve two times speed up. So how much faster? So basically here's the instruction from your boss. I, as a game console company, right? I want you to speed up, speed up the process, make the user experience better. And, um, Go ahead and invent a new technology so that the map loading processor a process can be two times faster compared again using solid state drive. How much that new technology? What's the new performance target of that process technology? A new technology needs to be.
All right, let's see. So, uh, there, well, so 52% of you think the answer is E, none of the above, right? So, you know, the answer is indeed E, right? Because if you use MDOS law, right, you will figure out if I want to achieve twice speed up, right? And the X is actually something nonsense, right? So what does that mean? The answer is none of the above, right? So it also means that, okay, if one day your boss is asking you to do this, right, he is actually giving you a gentle reminder you should submit your resume to other companies and find a job, you know, because that's impossible, right? So here's the thing, right? The first corollary of MDOS law is actually telling you about why we need this MDOS law is because it can actually tell you where's the upper bound of a, an up, a, like speeding up some part of your code. Because if you think about what's the best we can do is to achieve uh, inf infinity in terms of a speed up. And if you put infinity in MDOS law, right, you would actually get one over one minus f. And uh, that's actually the upper bound of MDOS low speed up, right? So if you put that back to the original calculation, you will know that it's not possible because the maximum you can achieve by optimizing uh, the SSD part is actually only 1.2 times. And that also explains why uh, Intel finally kills the optim memory, which is a faster SSD. Because right now we don't find sufficient amount of stuff spending significant enough of time to make the economics of um, uh, a new storage device. All right, so that's the implication of MDOS loads, right? So that's why something that we can learn from the businessman, right? Like what's the maximum potential of that? All right, so uh, before you leave the classroom, several things I want to let you know. First of all, assignment one due this Thursday. I only see uh, eight submissions for now. Uh, and you know, uh, we have auto grader and don't forget, uh, we don't do regrading this time. So once you submit it uh, before the deadline, uh, what shows up on auto grader, that's your final grading for uh, the assignment. And before that, you have a limited time to submit your assignment. So you can keep improving before the deadline, but uh, you have to submit before the deadline to get a grade. And uh, assignment two is already released due uh, the Thursday after this one. And uh, also a lot of you were, some of you were asking, do we have eLearn, do we have Canvas? We don't use that platform because I have bad experience with that. You always get your grades wrong. So, uh, and the, the response is so slow, so let's not use it. And uh, website is the, uh, is the portal for every resource. And uh, we use Grayscope for quizzes, assignments, and we use Piazza for discussions. And we do have office hours. Check the time on our website. That's the best way to get help for your assignment. Other than that, I will see you on Thursday.